hope I didn't. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. So, um... All right, everyone, we're going to get started. All right, everyone, good evening and welcome to our work session number 92 on Thursday, March 19th, strategic planning. Uh, school board members, a bit of housekeeping if you haven't already signed your release forms. And for those in the audience, we have um, a crew here from the National School Boards Association, and we are allowing them to film this meeting, not for content, just, just for visual presentation. And they will be using some of this promotional video to, pr to promote their national connection program at the upcoming NSBA school board meeting, which the majority of us are attending. Mr. Chair? So should I put this away? Uh, uh, you know, you never know. Uh, Connor, how do, you, how do you like the chair uh, chewing pizza? How does that look on video? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, and... Uh, That's pretty typical. <laughs> there you go, and uh, as I said, please sign your release forms and return them to Ms. Partlow. Thank you so much. So tonight, we are extremely excited to have a uh, guest tonight from the ECRA group, and uh, Mr. Dan Paris will introduce those people. And we are talking tonight about the long-awaited strategic planning uh, process that we will all be undertaking, and the ECRA group will be helping us. So I will turn it over to Mr. Paris. They will make a brief, he will introduce everyone. They will make a brief presentation, and then we'll have the opportunity for question and answers from the board, as always. So thank you, Mr. Paris. Thanks, Tammy. And Mr. Moon, if you're uncomfortable with the pizza and you'd rather pass it down here and let me hold it during the work session, I'm happy to, happy to help I'll you still, out. I'll still keep it. Okay, that's kind of what I thought you were going to say, but I would check. Uh, I uh, echo the uh, sentiment that uh, I'm very excited about uh, this evening and looking forward to it to introduce our strategic uh, partners to help us with the planning process. Uh, before I do that, just to set some uh, context, this is something I think as a uh, division that we began talking about the likelihood and the uh, uh, looking forward to engaging this process even prior to uh, Dr. Garza's arrival. And leading up to that, we've addressed this internally and, and had some thoughts. We've, uh, Dr. Garza, since her arrival, has certainly uh, executed uh, almost an unprecedented amount of outreach efforts to talk about what it is that we could do to, that we love about the district, things we'd like to change, opportunities for uh, improvement. Uh, we launched the Portrait of Graduate work that uh, you know, looked at attributes that we would aspire to for the graduates from our system. Uh, we also engaged in a, a competitive process to select uh, a partner that was well represented from both the board, the superintendent's office, uh, the departments, uh, their clusters, and our school folks to make that selection. And uh, that was a, a, a very uh, engaging and informative process. And I'm happy to tell you tonight that I'm here to introduce uh, our partners to help us go further into that work. And so I have John Gatta, who is the president of the uh, ECRA group that is uh, two to my left. Gina Simonek, who is the vice president for the ECHO Group and, uh, and the voice of your phone conversations that you've had leading up to this. And, uh, and Hank Demetro, uh, who uh, we all know from uh, some previous work within the district. So 
I'm very uh, excited at this point to turn it over to John to give you some more depth about our plans for this process. Uh, great. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we're really excited to be here. And so, uh, you know, on behalf of the ECRA Group team that's here, my name is Sean Gott. I'm the president of ECRA Group. But uh, we're just really excited about the opportunity to be a part of this strategic planning process. And we're really excited about the opportunity to help support uh, Fairfax County Public Schools in such an important process. And uh, what's been great about this is that the uh, the work of the division over the last couple of years have really set the stage for this process. And this couldn't be happening at a better time. Uh, because it's really important for the for the timing of these things to be ripe, and so uh, what we've done is uh, take all of the the great things that you've been doing over the last couple of years and really try to design a process that's really going to get you to ultimately what you want to get out of this process. And so, uh, what I plan to do is give you a brief presentation over the process, some of the philosophies behind the process, the component, the actual work that we plan to engage in, and then uh, actually turn it over to Gina Semenik to uh, lead some discussion here as far as uh, ultimately what we want to get out of this. And so uh, before I move forward, I want to make sure that uh, proper introductions uh, are made. And so uh, Dr. Gina Semenik is the Executive Vice President uh, of ECRA Group and also heads up uh, ECRA Group's Strategic Planning Division. And she will be the lead consultant for this project. So Gina will be responsible for uh, not, o not only the uh, design of the process, but the delivery of all of the uh, services as it relates to this process and leading the uh, leading the teams in the field and making sure that everything goes as, uh, as planned. Uh, my role in this process will be to uh, provide some methodological oversight and to provide some expertise as it relates to uh, analytics and research and benchmarks and, and metrics uh, when the time is right. Um, all of you, uh, I think, know um, Hank Jamitro. Hank couldn't be here, so we got his brother Henry <laughs> to come tonight. He's my twin. <laughs> Um, Maybe. But for, through all the conversations that we've had with uh, Hank and his opportunity to work with Fairfax County Public Schools and the Board of Education, uh, we, we're, it just made us that much more excited to get, uh, uh, to get moving on this project. And so Hank's role in the process is really going to be um, uh, threefold. He'll serve as a process advisor because of his intimate knowledge of the district through working uh, with the district. We, we thought it was critically important to have uh, him as a member of this team so that uh, all of that knowledge could be um, you know, incorporated uh, into this process. He will also serve uh, to help some of the board conversations and facilitations uh, throughout the process when key facilitation has to happen at the board level. Uh, you know, Hank's work with the board, we thought it was a good idea to, to keep that continuity going and making sure that uh, that, that piece, uh, you know, moves forward. And in addition, as I'm going to lay out, this process is going to collect a whole lot of information and conduct a whole lot of outreach and do a whole lot of research uh, as part of the process. And Hank, as a component of that, is going to be looking at some of the uh, internal structures of the district as well uh, to be one of the information sources that contribute to the overall plan. And so, um, you know, with that, just With that, just a few brief comments about ECRA Group. Uh, I feel like the board does uh, know ECRA Group through its relationship with, with Hank and some of the work that he's been doing. Uh, but just uh, as a little broader introduction, um, ECRA Group is a, a multidimensional consulting firm that's really whose mission is to support uh, public schools, and not only public schools, but all schools in achieving their mission. Uh, and we believe in uh, the marriage of leadership, planning, and information as really kind of pillars to uh, organizational improvement. And so, uh, you know, Hank heads up our um, uh, leadership and executive uh, search division, which deals with uh, the leadership implications uh, of schools. Uh, Dr. S uh, Semenik heads up our strategic planning and our research and analytics division. Uh, we have a measurement and assessment division as well. And all of that expertise comes uh, to bear through the strategic planning process. And so uh, the great thing about strategic planning is that uh, through our resources and through the various divisions that we have, we can bring the blend of expertise that's needed throughout the process as it's needed uh, to, you know, to make sure that the right kind of guidance is, uh, is implemented in the process at the right times. So the components of the strategic planning process are 
and I'm going to go a little bit in depth about the process, but the components of what, you know, what are we ultimately trying to accomplish here? And so at the largest, uh, at the highest level here, you know, we're starting with the beliefs, the mission, the values of the school district. I'm going to talk about how we're going to uh, use the information from a variety of sources to, um, to get at these components. But the first piece of this is really uh, who are you, what are you trying to accomplish, right? And what information has to come to bear to really be grounded in, you know, who we are and what we're trying to create here uh, at Fairfax County Public Schools, right? That will lead to strategic goals and objectives which provide broad direction uh, for the school division as far as uh, what needs to be focused on if it's ultimately going to uh, realize its vision and its mission. And then ultimately that will lead to tactics uh, and implementation plans as well as execution and metrics to, um, you know, to monitor the implementation of the plan. And so from a components uh, perspective, uh, the first two pieces will be uh, phase one of the process by conducting a whole lot of research and looking at the current state of reality in relationship to the desired future position of the school district. All of that will come together into strategic goals and objectives as the as the second phase the third phase being specific tactics and action plans that we're going to use to implement uh, from a process perspective the 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 process is designed is designed as a discipline process it's designed as a very research based process and it's designed uh, with the philosophy of uh, engaging as many uh, stakeholders as we can using research, using technologies that are available to us to, to tap the collective wisdom of stakeholders. The one thing that's great about Fairfax County Public Schools is the incredible wisdom and assets that, that live within all of your stakeholders, your faculty, your staff, your community members. And so when we designed this process, we really designed this process to say, how do we tap the collective wisdom of all these stakeholders? How do we create a process in which innovation can be born uh, at a grassroots level of really, you know, where does this district need to focus on uh, to, uh, to really move forward? And so in addition to the stakeholder engagement that's going to be done, uh, we've done individual board interviews. There will be more opportunities for the uh, board to be involved throughout the process at, at key decision points. Uh, we're going to conduct focus groups extensively with the stakeholder populations, and Dr. Semenik will go into more detail about our plans of exactly how we plan uh, to do that. We will review your current mission, vision, value statements, and we will review a variety of um, whether it's archival data or existing reports or past studies. And some of this, the, the specific things that we're going to link into this, the great work that's been done with the portrait of a graduate, the great work that's been done um, with some of the outreach that has happened um, recently, all of that is going to dovetail into this process. So all of that will be considered as we uh, move forward for goals uh, and objectives. We are going to administer some additional surveys. So we'll uh, administer surveys to all the major uh, stakeholder groups as well. And we are also going to perform a rigorous analysis of student achievement data. And so uh, we're going to be looking in, in a very sophisticated way uh, at trends within the district, achievement profiles, again, to uh, triangulate all of these findings. And so what is really the goal of, of phase one? The goal of phase one is to come up with uh, some statements of finding to document what is the current state of reality for the district, what is the desired future position of the district, but articulated in a set of findings that can be sort of stipulated to for the sake of planning going forward. And so I think what you're going to uh, get an appreciation for is how disciplined the process is and hopefully get a, an appreciation for uh, how much work goes into the synthesis of all the information that we're going to be collecting and how much work goes into the documentation and substantiation of the findings that will result uh, from phase one, which will provide the platform for all the future planning. Once phase one is complete, at that point we have statements of finding. And so those statements of finding will be dialogued about at the, at the, uh, at the board level. We will use those findings to sketch out a strategic planning document in the form of goals and objectives, not to be the plan, but to sort of jumpstart the conversations of given the findings, here's how we think it kind of sketches out. The board will then take that and dialogue over that uh, about trying to finalize what those final goals uh, and objectives will look like. Uh, that will be the milestone of phase two. And at that point, we'll move on to uh, the uh, tactical and implementation plan, which is going back out to the community and working with your stakeholders around implementation. So the, the engagement process will happen up front 
as a means to document the current state of reality and the desired future position, but it will also happen again in phase three as we build implementation plans to go back out and again uh, tap some of the, of the collective wisdom of your internal stakeholders uh, around how to best do that. And, and one of the things that we're going to uh, pay really special attention to, no, just the, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to. One of the things we're going to pay special attention to throughout this process and as we try to uh, delineate what our goals and objectives and what are uh, the tactics that are going to have to be used to implement the strategic plan is uh, trying to arrive at the, pr at the balance between what is sort of some strategic standardization at the division level and then some of the tactical autonomy that has to exist at the cluster level uh, in order to, to let that innovation happen. Because a lot of the innovation happens, you know, within the schools, within the clusters, but but you are a division of schools, and so you have to have some strategic priorities that everybody aligns to. And I think the process is designed to uh, try to draw that line in the sand of what is strategic in the sense that it, is, it makes up who Fairfax County Public Schools is, right? It's, it's linked into the belief statements fundamentally about education, and so that everybody has to link to. And then what are part of the tactical pieces that, that schools or divisions can have, or clusters can have some autonomy to innovate around to say, this is what this means for our school, or this is what this means for our uh, cluster. And, and we have found that that balance creates the best innovation. Uh, but that is also the challenge of this process, of how do, you, how do you delineate that in a way in which people are given direction, but still are given some autonomy. And so that's sort of one of the things that we're going to be paying a whole lot of attention to uh, throughout this process. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Semenik, who will lead you through our plan for the stakeholder engagement piece of this. And Thank you, thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet everyone after having spoken to each of you. Thank you so much for spending the time, though. It was very insightful, great, great discussion, and a nice start. And as John had illustrated um, in phase one, we start at the top. So part of it, you know, we're, we're well into it already. Part of it is I've spoken to each of you individually. And the next level is then, whoop. The next step is, um, to look at how do we get the stakeholders at the school level involved. And this is an inclusive um, approach. And the idea is to try to get to every level. So if you look at the clusters, our, our, our goal here is to go across the clusters, all eight clusters, and, and then go deep within the cluster so that we are giving every stakeholder group a voice because everyone's voice matters here. Um, we would hope to be able to speak with uh, um, school leaders, the principals, um, you know, separate focus group with teachers and staff, um, parents, some PTA community members, and students. It's um, always a good idea. We love speaking and hearing from the students in the middle and in high school especially. Um, very insightful, you know, good information. But through that process, our goal is to collect um, great thoughts and ideas that they have, what types of things it is that they value, what they expect from public education themselves. Um, but along the way, you gain some practical knowledge there as well because you have some skills there and you have to, you know, skill is real important to vision. And when you're planning strategically, um, you want to make sure you're asking the right people the questions um, that have the skills that understand how in practice it's going to play out. Um, that's also how you're going to get your commitment and your buy-in by going through and making sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate. So we will hold these individual focus groups tailored around the stakeholder groups. In addition to that, as, as um, John had said, we'll go out a little bit broader with the surveys and make surveys uh, available again through the community and, and all the stakeholders. Um, in the end, um, what we hope to be able to demonstrate through all the, the information we collect is truly what, what do your communities at large and the stakeholders across the division, what do, they, what do they value, what do they philosophically believe, what do they expect from the system, and, and what do they have to offer in terms of suggestions given some of um, what they are, they've already been involved quite a bit you know, through Dr. Garza and through the, the leadership profile. Now, I've asked each of you individually these questions, but just as a jump start tonight to think about them, um, this is, like I said, a familiar question, but we really have to hear what do you really hope to gain, um, or for this process, what do you really hope is, what's the outcome of this? What is it that you really expect or need or are hoping to be able to achieve? And then what are some key issues or concerns? What are the main um, issues that you want to make sure are considered in this process that, and, you know, in terms of to ensure that they are addressed? And then any other additional questions, of course, we're here to respond to. 
You want to take it? All right. Thank you for that concise um, information. So, board members, this is our this is our chance. Um, you know, what do we want to achieve? What are our key issues and concerns? I, as she said, I, I do want to thank you all, and you in particular, um, Dr. Semenik, for um, the conversation we had. I, I had my interview a few days ago. I know there were four of us who had it that day, and I found it to just be a, a, a great opportunity to to talk about uh, where we as a board wanted and needed to go. Um, of course, you know, and each of us has our own perspective and then and that's the challenge is how do we garner that and, and get that all together. So, um, questions? All right, I'll start with Ms. Hines followed by Ms. Schultz. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, and this may be sort of a narrow question, but I wanted to start with it uh, because, you know, one of the things that we're always concerned about is can we do everything we want to do within our financial constraints? And so our funding partners are very important to us. And one of the things that I forgot to mention in my phone conversation was the possibility of including our county leaders, our board of supervisors, in this process somehow. And I'm not sure how, but I think they are... Uh, in a sense, a stakeholder group. They get a lot of questions about the school system. They care very much about the school system. So did you have any thought, I mean, I'm maybe putting you on the spot about how we might be able to include them? No, and in some, sorry, thank you. Some, we did have some discussion with, with um, some of the individual members. Um, there will be an opportunity. If, there, if there's a way to engage them, then we will have opportunities to engage, you know, community um, forums, um, either during the day or in, in the evening. But we will work collaboratively with the, with, you know, with the district in terms of, um, making sure that those people are at least given an opportunity to come in. Um, there will be a series of open community forums in terms of them being able to attend. And one of the things that we were able to set up in the leadership profile process was the ability to meet with them as a group. They have some laws about or and some regulations about what they can meet a, about as a group in closed session versus open session, but I'm sure we can explore those possibilities with them to see how that might work out within their parameters of if they can talk to us as a group or do they have to talk to us individually. Great, because um, I've talked to my own supervisor and I know that's something she'd be very interested in, just having a chance to weigh in and then get her own sort of report out, you know, to feel like she's part of the process. Thank you, Ms. Hines, and I will share. I, I advocated that during my conversation as well, so thank you. Ms. Schultz? So um, just a couple of things. Um, Hank, with regard to um, the community engagement piece, would that look something similar to, because I, I see, I can understand the school leadership, the school faculty, school staff, but once you kind of cross that bridge into the other side, which is the parents, students, and other community groups. Does that look similar in practice to the superintendent search in terms of how, I, I mean, are you just going to post out meetings? I mean, how do you draw in on, um, doctor, on the, the definition that you go across the clusters and then deeper down? How, how does that functionally happen? Um, we looked at establishing um, three open community forums in the evening and then also one during the day as an opportunity for those people to participate and we still have the list of all those groups that we invited through the last process so they can all be specifically um, invited in um, and if we need to go beyond that in terms of finding ways to reach out to specific groups who want to participate in that we can do that we also thought about asking the cluster leaders and the school leaders to invite key individuals to those meetings at in those sites as we're out in those locations. And the reason I ask is on, on the superintendent side, clearly you could get individual feedback from parents and students and community members about what they saw in as qualities that they wanted in a leader, which we got. Uh, um, However, I'm wondering how informed they are. I mean, how, how do you structure a conversation about strategic plan for a school district? Are they, I mean, has this worked in best practice elsewhere? Is this a, a normal thing that they, that the community members know how to talk about a strategic plan for a school division, particularly of this size? 
So yeah. So the short answer is there. There are they are very structured um, uh, questions, uh, but uh, you know you're absolutely right that the uh, the different groups will have different levels of expertise to different areas related to education. Um, but one of the things that we have uh, found sort of unanimously is that one, the more people that you can engage, the, the more opportunity you get innovation to surface. Uh, and so uh, you know the, the the whole again this. The, this collective wisdom of groups, especially uh, communities um, that are part of Fairfax County Public Schools, is just really important to provide the opportunity to tap those assets. And so uh, we just think it's a critical piece uh, of the process. Uh, the second piece is while many community members that are you know, as sort of external to the educational sector, uh, while they may not have specific knowledge about which exact strategies are going to work or what do we need to do with the reading program, they will have very definitive views as to what they believe. And so this process is as much about understanding the beliefs of the community so that you can align to that um, as it is about uh, what specific steps are we going to take. And so, so, so basically, the f it will be framed and there will be a structure in such a way that that will allow them to competently, based on where they are, competently participate at their level, and there will be some structure. And then the only other question I had was, you know, I saw August, and I, you know, I got a little deflated. <laughs> I, I guess that's, you know, I'm, Dr. Garz is whispering in my ear that that's, you know, a great schedule. And of course, you know, it's very, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, yeah. it, it, so it is. So that's kind of like the best hopes that we can expect. Yeah, that's pretty. Given the kinds of outreach that are going to happen and the kinds of analyses that have to be performed, that's that, that's a very aggressive timeline. A time that absolutely we can hit. You know, provided that we we stick to some timelines uh, okay. and some dates. And and we'll be able to access the the. Re, the other part of the concern with the August is that I'm looking at when you go across those clusters and across those groups that I'm, it looks like a lot of the engagement will need to happen in the summer. And no, no, no. 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 Uh, okay. It's, the, it's, that all that's all front loaded in the end in, in phase one. Yeah. So phase, so phase one. Oh, we have, we have, we have. So phase one is where all of the outreach is going to happen from a broad-based perspective. So all of that outreach will be done um, uh, by the end of May, and all the analysis will be done by the, by the end Didn't of May. Didn't you say you wrap back around in the third phase? For, the, for the internal stakeholders. Okay. We don't go back out to external states. For the okay. implementation, we go back to internal stakeholders. And so you know, from a broad perspective, we thought the timing of um, finishing all of the analysis and research at the end of May so that we could do all of the synthesis and provide draft plans uh, to the board in July so that when the board comes together in July, uh, they could have dialogue over what that plan looks like with the, uh, with the idea that uh, at, the end, at the end of July, you'd have a, a strategic plan in place that then we could be transitioning to uh, the implementation with the administration in August and beyond. Implementation you know, will go beyond August, but then we can start those conversations. We can go back out to the clusters, um, start facilitating meetings to get organized. Okay. And that's, that was really the only other question was because during the superintendent search, you remember, we went back and forth about whether to go back out to the community a second time to validate what we heard, but I can see that maybe that's you know this is a slightly different process so thank you very much may I add to that just real quickly so in a lot in um, kind of furthering that conversation so I'm assuming based on the timeline at the end of May between June and July there's gonna be a lot of internal working around refining the documents is that correct so there's gonna be a lot of work going on in June and July yes. in order to create a document for the board to react to and maybe some some meetings in there where you we actually get feedback from the board so a lot going on in june july is that correct uh yeah and i think the other piece that we were looking at at july is that your at your july workshop at your july workshop a significant amount of time um, could be devoted to the review of the strategic plan because we would hope to have a draft by that point in time for you to be reviewing weighing in on and seeing if we need more information iterations need to be made in that process before we start working on the tactical plan. And as this is a partnership, you know, the, the way that schools operate, the early part of August is when you come back in, you begin your school plan work. So the timing and the interface of this works pretty well for us, I think. One last thing on this. Um, 
before you leave, we'd like to give you a set or, or scheduled board meetings from this point through through August. You may have gotten that today. But I would just encourage you um, that any of that time that you're going to need from the board, whether that be a board retreat or any time that you're going to need of this of this body, if you could just let us know as, as soon as possible so we can get that on on their schedules. Yes, thank you all. I think it, it is important to understand the timeline. I think it is. It, it is aggressive but doable, and um, I think you know if we have that intense work as a board right before the July session ends, and we have our time off in August, that gives you all, as Mr. Paris said, time as a leadership team to give uh, pull that all together and then report back to us in the start of September. So thank you. Um, next is Mr. Valkoff, followed by Mr. Moon. So I wanted to. Uh First of all, uh, Dr. Subnick, thank you for the phone call. I think we had the snow day when we were yes. uh, on the phone. Um, so I have uh, identified uh, four objectives, and two of them have to do with organization, and uh, two of them have to do with process. And I think I'll start with the two having to do with process. So as I see it, what, um, what I would like to see us end up with is um, uh, process is for first of all a, a scheduled review of the work of the school system and uh, secondly like actually that's yeah that, and, and before that even is uh, a process for controlled planning of the work of the school system then in terms of um, organization I, I hope that we'll come out of this with some recommendations about how the school system itself may be organized differently and I hope we also can discuss the organization of the school board staff. Um, and what I would say is, I'll make a couple of comments of what drives these things for me. I think, I feel like some of our work is, um, uh, it, it's reactive and ad hoc. And that's where the planning comes in, is to be able to um, reach agreement between the leadership team of the school system and among the board members that We've laid out a plan. These are the things that are important. And yes, I know this is bubbling up, but we have to have a process for deciding whether the things that are bubbling up really have to be actionable or not. We have to have a way of dealing with that. I think we're missing that. Um, I think some of the actions that we've taken in organizing our school board office have been a little ad hoc and reactive. And I think this is an opportunity for us to think intentionally about how we want to organize our own staff going forward. So those are the heavy hitters for me. And you can comment if you like. One, one comment you know, in relationship to that is one of the great benefits, though, of having a well thought out strategic plan is that it's going to give you that framework that you're looking for. It's going to provide that decision making framework, that governance framework uh, for the Board of Education. So when, when those issues do bubble up, we know they're going to bubble up. You can't prevent that, but what you can do is having, you can have a decision-making framework that you can uh, take those issues and put them up against to say, is this strategic? Is this moving us in the right direction? And then take the appropriate action to, uh, to govern appropriately. And so I think, uh, I think that is a benefit of this process, and I think you'll be pleased with the way that the framework allows those decisions to, uh, to be processed. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Moon, followed by Ms. Evans. Uh, thank you. I, do, I, I guess I do have a couple of fundamental questions. Uh, I'm glad to see Mrs. Rouse, because otherwise, without you, I may, might have to call myself as the longest serving <laughs> member on the board without you. I was you, out begging for money in Herndon. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, Mrs. Rouse is the longest serving you know, board member uh, right now, and she is she is not only a historian, but she is also a librarian. Uh, all the information and knowledge we need to have uh, as a board member. But I have, having, even having said that, even with the 15 years of experience on the board, my experience is very limited, only in Fairfax. You three are experts, and we are relying upon uh, your assistance to develop a strategic plan. I obviously, you know, you deal with many different districts in the country, uh, you know, districts somewhat very similar to ours, and maybe districts, you know, very different from ours, too. Some as good as ours, some maybe even better than ours, and hoping to 
Oh, thank you. Thank you for shaking your head. I just you know, wanted some validation from you that we are pretty good. Uh, but having said that, I am only familiar with what I have gone through in Fairfax, you know, which is basically what you have right now for last 10-year period, you know, nine or 10-year period. Also prior to that, uh, you know, working with Dr. Dominic on the different, different model. So I'm, I only know of two different models for you know, setting goals and what you, are, what you are trying to achieve. I am, I know that you might not have had an opportunity to go through what we have, what Fairfax County has been doing or had done in the past. You will go through that, but I'm still trying to get a better grasp of what the product, what the final product will be getting, how that's gonna be different from what we currently have, and what I used to know, working with Dr. Dominic, when we used to have 10 targets, 10 goals, we had, we had, we had goals for each target, and we also had you know, timeline, we also had implementation plans, and et cetera. Uh, but at one point, we decided that that wasn't good enough, that was not the right way to go. So we walked away from that model, and we got into this student achievement goal, due governance, you know, model, and we've been working under this model for the last eight, nine, ten year period. So I am, again, I mean, I'm relying upon you experts to let me know, educate me, what other models are out there, and you will be reviewing our information and just, you know, let us know, let me know, teach me that this is far better model than what we are currently doing, or we are just doing as fine as we can ever do. Go ahead. I would make a few comments, um, you know, related to that. Uh, you know, one, I can speak, um, you know, as far as what this process is going to do and what this process is going to create without having intimate knowledge of what's been done, you know, in the past here. But, you know, you're right in the sense, if I understood the, the, the question, I think you're right in the sense that when you talk about different models, you know, there's different ways to plan, there's different ways to organize the work of an organization. And there's, and, uh, and so there's, um, there's different ways that you can think about organizing the work of, uh, you know, of, of a school division. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to end up with um, plans for what you believe are the leverage points of the system, what you believe, if you focus on, should impact everything that you're trying to impact. And, you know, what a strategic plan is all about is providing the organization focus. It's, it's to provide the organizational focus so you can channel all of the energy, and not just resources, not just dollars, but to channel all the energy of your stakeholders. You know, you have, you have faculty and teachers that are committed and staff that are committed and parents are committed. If you can harness that energy and you can align that energy and get everybody pushing in the same direction, you're gonna see tremendous results. And so that's really what the process is aimed at. Now, you could you could look at different ways to call things. You know, are we calling things objectives? Are we calling things strategies? Are they goals? You could go on and on of different frameworks, but every framework has a clear path for what you believe is going to make the difference. And what we have learned, I would say, over and over through all of our work uh, in working with uh, school systems and school divisions, is that places like Fairfax County Public Schools is not, sh uh, you are not short of great ideas. You are not short of great strategies. You are not short of innovation. The challenge is gonna become choosing wisely, right? How do, of all of the things we could focus on, what do we really need to focus on to make the difference? And so I think the challenge is not gonna be what should we do, but narrowing what you're gonna do. And so, because the success of this, if I look three, five, seven, ten years out, the success of this is gonna be less related to what strategies you actually ended up with, because they're, it's gonna be amongst a menu of I think strategies that would work, but you're gonna to have to focus. It's gonna live or die with the execution of it. It's gonna live or die with did we commit to the direction and did we implement, implement, implement. What we find in general in public education, it is less about the choice of what you're doing and it is more about the commitment to those choices and the commitment to aligning the organization to implement. And if you can do that and you can get people together, you're gonna to see a tremendous impact. 
Thank yeah, you. And Gina. So, and part of that co comes from the engagement process. So listening to what everybody has to say and really understanding their priorities and their values is the first step. But ultimately, when we come back in July to work with the board and really gain your consensus, what John's referring to is just w what I'd mentioned to each of you. It's not about which two or three things you choose to do. It's once you choose them that you stay committed to drive them forward. And that's every time you have a new opportunity or a new initiative, the question becomes, is this going to, if we do this, is it going to move us closer to that vision or closer to accomplishing what, what we set out to do? And, and it's about the commitment. Because it, it, you can choose any of them, but if the commitment isn't there, um, you know, none of them are going to be successful. In, in, in two comments to close, that's why the stakeholder engagement is, is so important. Because if you don't choose the strategies that people believe are the, the right ones, it's going to be harder to, to, to rally people around those. And so that's why that engagement piece is so important. Uh, and to the other, the, the comment about uh, ECRA serving as you know, an expert resource along this, uh, this process too and bringing some of the, the uh, aggregation of information that we have as a firm and working with school districts across the country, um, you're going to get that not only through the conversations that you have with us, but uh, you know, part of this process is we do present a sort of a draft plan. Now, you're going to dialogue, you're going to change it. But that draft plan does in some sense reflect given everything we've collected, given all the findings, given everything that we have, this is our sort of thinking on the issue. Um, but that's just meant to jumpstart your conversations. Uh, but so, you know, the, the point of that is how do, you, how do we in, inject our sort of expertise and perspective on all of this throughout the process? You know, I think that's, it comes through the facilitation work that, um, that I, I'm sure you've already um, uh, come to understand with Hank is how, you, how that knowledge comes through with facilitation and so that there's an opportunity there and, and an avenue to tap that uh, through some of the draft documents um, that we create as well as all of the, uh, the conversations that are going to happen from now all the way through the fall. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I'm going to just going to share what Dr. Garza mouthed to me. Um, and I think this is true, and, and you said this. It, it's going to take commitment, but it's also going to take our, our collective leadership and discipline. I think that's, that's the key. But as you stated, when you have the buy-in from the stakeholders, you're all working off the same page. So the discipline and the commitment should be easy to attain because we're all working together to achieve the, these goals that we've set out as a community for ourselves. So next on the agenda is Ms. Evans, followed by Mr. Stork. Yes, thank you, and I appreciate the conversation that, uh, that we had earlier. Um, it, it was a, a very good conversation. Um, similarly to, to Mr. Moon, I guess I'm trying to get a better feel for you know, where our end product will be here. You, know, you mentioned one or two things, and I, I think it's fair to say that our school system is not going to want to, at any given time, be doing just one or two things. I mean, now we may be doing too many, but uh, we also don't want to be doing too few. So uh, could you sort of take us to the end of the road and tell us a little bit more? You know, you, you mentioned a draft plan. You know, are we talking about you're going to give us a draft plan with issue by issue? Um, are you going to give us something that will end up being, you know, like our goal one, goal two, goal three? Um, give us a little bit more concrete sense, if you would, about what, or perhaps you've done this in another school district where you could say, you know, how they ended up. So there's going to be um, three main deliverables, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, you know, th uh, throughout this process, which would be commensurate with the phases. And so the first piece of this, and, and the deliverables for phase one and two will come together. And so I'm, I'm going to answer this question of sort of like what are we going to point to that ECRA is going to provide, you know, mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. um, is. So the, f the first thing that, that you're going to have is um, what we call a supporting evidence document. And so what is that? What that's going to be is that's going to be a summary of all of the information that we've collected and a synthesis of how all of that information triangulates into statements of finding. And so that document will list everybody that we talked to, what we've learned, the survey results, the achievement analysis, the review of archival data. But we will analyze and synthesize that in a way in which what you're going to end up with in that document are statements of finding. And what we mean by that is what have we learned? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what are some uh, assumptions 
that the board can agree on are reasonable assumptions for the sake of planning going forward. Because uh, in order to really have a robust dialogue on really where we're headed, at some point you have to stipulate to what do we believe to be true about our school division. And so that supporting evidence is going to, uh, again, jumpstart that conversation but give you a whole wealth of data and information to substantiate why the statements are um, within the document, that, you know, the way that they are. So that's sort of a, a deliverable. Um, the second deliverable would be this draft plan, which will be much more streamlined of a document, will, which will be given that, given the statement of findings, right? What are three to five goals and some objectives under those goals that really organize and focus uh, the school system. That will be the starting point for the board to have a conversation. And that document will be vetted with the administration and it's up leading up to that. But when the draft plan goes to the board, it will be sort of the, um, a draft of the current thinking around, given the findings, what is a reasonable place to start the conversation. And I'm thinking that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you if you uh, had more to. If, if I could add, maybe a way to translate this is what you currently have and what it might look like moving forward. So mm -hmm. if you take goal one, which is your academic goal, mm -hmm. um, it is certainly focused on academics. It touches almost every area. There's very little that you can say that you do in this organization as a strategic initiative that doesn't tie back to that mm -hmm. academic goal. Right. Well, you had 22 initiatives last year. Um, this past year from when I met with the principals and they were talking about 22 different initiatives and their ability to do 22 different initiatives well was not was not something that they felt capable of doing. So when you do the analysis of information from the community and from the staff and from the leadership perspective and you do the analysis of student performance, maybe there's two or three or four or five or six key areas in those academic areas that should be closely paid attention to over the next two or three years. Okay. And those can be identified through what John was describing as that statement of finding. Um, now, it's easy to say, maybe it's uh, the example I used with um, the principals when I was talking with them was uh, middle school math performance. Maybe the the I, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying maybe that's, that's an issue that gets identified, that middle school math performance is not where the community, the staff, the board feels that it should be. And so does that need to be a focus during a period of time moving forward? Maybe it's a different type of goal because you have so many different levels of students in different schools that have different kinds of needs. Maybe one of the things that gets identified out of that analysis of student performance is that while your overall performance is really strong, are children really reaching their potential? And so maybe one of the areas in academics isn't just simply a subject area or a performance area, it's how do you create a system where students are maximizing their individual potential? And so the goals that will be crafted out of the analysis of that information will be tied back to what the community expectations are mm -hmm. and what the resulting analysis of the information with the, in the system is. Okay. Um, essential learning life skills. You have some, are, um, the essential life skills that you have identified are things that I think there's pr fairly common agreement about in terms of your community, that those are important, but you really this will be my hunch, I don't know that it's the case, but you really don't have a way of measuring that right now. You don't have a system in place to the degree that you might want to have that measured to say, it, are your schools really making a difference in children's life skills? Mm -hmm. And so maybe one of the goals becomes that metrics and measurement systems need to be developed in certain areas that are high priority areas as you move forward. Mm -hmm. um, I know that as a result of the portrait of a graduate, you identified some areas in which you feel like you have really good measurements in, and some areas that you're going to need to develop measurements for as you move forward. So mm -hmm. those issues may emerge out of the analysis of that information. And I'm glad you brought up portrait of a graduate because I was going to ask about that. We've just had a, sig a significant amount of time and effort and we're still developing the portrait of a graduate. You know, we have a draft that we're going to be reviewing at some point. To what extent does that work then 
guide what you're doing? Because I, I think that we have spent a significant amount of time on that. I, I think that work is going to drive what we do in terms of if this, okay. if this is your definition of okay. a highly um, successful graduate from the Fairfax Public Schools, what do you need to do to accomplish those results? In some places, you have things really well defined that you can measure those things, know how well you're progressing, and say, we're on the right track, we're going to continue doing what we're doing. In other places, you may have measurements that say we're not quite on the right track, and what do we need to be doing differently to be more successful in these areas? Mm -hmm. And in some places, as Dan talked about at the um, retreat where he talked about the assessment matrix and the four different kinds of assessments that may be necessary, you may not have assessments at all in some of those outcomes that you hope to accomplish with students, and you're going to have to create those measurements mm -hmm. uh, in order to know whether the programs and services you're putting in place are making the difference that you want to. Okay. And all of those things, I think, can emerge out of the strategic planning process to say, what are your priorities, priorities over the next three, five, seven, eight years as you work on those those efforts. Okay. And I would guess then at that point, and I'll turn it over to the next person, but my comment would be, I hope we do pay significant attention to goal two, the essential life skills, and um, as well to health and wellness. You know, that's been um, a major topic. Uh, we just had a mock work session or mock forum earlier today where, you know, it was a health and wellness issue that, that the students pinpointed. So um, I, would, I would urge um, that we have at least enough attention to that area. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, Mr. Stork, followed by Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with something basic, just to make sure that we're all, I guess, using the same language in the same way. Can you define goal and define objective for me in terms of your work? Sure. Uh, and so, and this is where I'm going to define them how we've, you know, how we normally define them. But I'm going to. Uh, preface that with um, in the land of strategic planning, in the vernacular of strategic planning, sometimes these terms take on their own definitions and sometimes um, aren't as specific as they should be. Um, so I can tell you how we define them, um, but I can also say that in working with uh, school systems all across the country, you know, sometimes they've had, they have an adopted vocabulary that they prefer. And so part of this process too will, will be, you know, sort of finalizing some of the final vocabulary um, around around this. Um, but the, the, the strategic goals, right, those, those three to five um, uh, goal areas are really what are those really important areas, right, that you really want to focus on and what is it that you want to create in those areas that automatically focus the energy um, of, the, of the school system or the school division, right? Then within those, there is a, it is a hierarchical relationship. Then within those are objectives, which really, objectives, what we really mean by that are, are broad tactics that give direction for what needs to be done, but they're written at a level of abstraction that still gives, again, autonomy once we get to the tactical phase. By the tactics, we mean very specific actions, um, you know, for what needs to be done. And so the, the, the art of this, Right? The art of this is the goals are, are a little bit easier because you sort of what after we go through this process, it's going to become a little bit clearer as to what are those three to five big leverage points, those big goal areas, right? But then inside the goals, the art of this is how do we write objectives, right? In the form of really broader tactics, right, that give enough direction. Right? But again, still leave room for local innovation and autonomy when each cluster builds the specific things they're going to do to implement that. And so that's the challenge. That's really the challenge is, is how do you write those objectives? Does that answer your question? Um, somewhat, and it and actually causes me a little bit more uh, concern too. How would you, um, how would you characterize the the goals that we currently have, the three broad goals, and then we have the things underneath them, I'll call them, just to leave them unnamed at the moment. Um, we have obviously the, the three that are over there, academics, essential life skills, responsibility of the community, which has been modified slightly, but those are, we would view them as goals. Would you view those as goals? Yeah. And the items that we have underneath those, would you view those as 
goals Ob or objectives? Objectives. So once you, if you were to delineate, if, if just looking at these things, so underneath that you're going to delineate a little bit uh, more um, um, uh, tangibly you know, what you mean by those things. And so the objectives, in some sense, provide some definition to the goals, but they also, if they're written right, should provide some direction as to what we're really going to be working on as it relates to each one of those areas. Because the goals that we have now, we have goals, and I would call them sub-goals, because they clearly aren't, in my eyes, objectives at least. Uh, they define, let's say for academics, they define it in, in more specific terms, but they're still very academically related. Like, um, we have a a prologue, and then we have specific, like including, um, you know, reading ability, writing, you know, uh, mathematic, you know, um, knowledge of, of technical technical skills, communicating in two languages, and some things that are kind of define that, um, define and practical arts, and so those are all parts of sub goals that we expect a level of performance and competence in each of those, again, sub goals, and we have the same for central life skills and responsibility to the community. We we spent years developing these goals and sub-goals that define what we believe, in essence, a portrait of a graduate should have. And I'm using, I'm kind of using, putting two things together, but I'm, I'm doing that because that was the overall intent of the board. We then have revisited those goals over the past two years to, and not only the goals, but also the uh, beliefs, the mission, the vision, those items. We spent a great deal of time in the last two years looking at those things in depth to make sure that they still we're representative of the board's, um, you know, intent about how we should operate our our school system. My concern and my question is, those are goals. I'm hearing you saying we should have, in essence, new goals or potential goals that come out of that, that uh, are going to define part of our strategic our strategic plan. Um, and I, I understand that we might uh, we might take on components of the goals that we have and maybe have a more narrowly written goal for a period of time, but I don't, I don't understand if what you're going, you're intending to do is go to stakeholders over the next three months. That's what it says in here is that we're going to go to stakeholders, we're going to talk to them about mission vision goals and, and get their input on those, which we've done multiple times over the years, essentially in my mind recirculate that issue for better or for worse, we may learn something, we may not, but spend time on that versus spending time on something that's, to me, at least was my intent when we did this last summer was to more narrowly focus ourselves over a more specific period of time on accomplishing certain outcomes, which for me are more in the nature of objectives. I view objectives as something that's very much more specific and definable. Objective says we're going to have 100% of our kids graduate, you know, from school by the time they're 50 years old. You know, that could be an objective. But we're going to define that in some way that we can measure that and, and, and uh, operationalize that and, and look to achieve that over X period of time. So, again, are we still talking about the same things, or is this, am I off track no, with, with no, what you all are doing? I'm, I'm, I'm really confused about the front end of this. I understand better the middle and the back end, but the front end, I'm, I'm not comfortable with at the moment. No, I think we're talking about exactly the same thing, and, and I didn't want to imply that we're necessarily going to redo goals, it's, but the process is going to engage and synthesize and um, refine, validate, revise, however you want to uh, look at it, but at the end of the day, the goals are going to reflect what the Board of Education believes the goals should reflect, and that's, um, you know, given all the input and given all the information that's collected as, as part of this process. And so I think, unfortunately, it, it's a bit of a semantics issue in that, you know, because at some point you have to have some, some broad areas that you want to impact, which those are very um, uh, easy to understand, right, For, on the surface of kind of sort of what's represented there. But in order to operationalize that, right, you, you do have to come up with some more granular statements Mm -hmm. for what is actually meant by each one of those. And then you also have to come up with some observable indicators, metrics, and benchmarks for how to monitor that. And so part of, so where I'm going and we with actually, And we actually have those for many of them. And, and I, Hank knows this better than I do. But we have those for many of them. We, we were cut short, if you will, in that development process, which was accurately presented in terms of the essential life skills. And so that's kind of what I'm coming back to is I, I'm still, I'm not 
comfortable that, that we have you all focused on something that's truly um, developmental for the organization versus kind of reviewing what we as an organization have kind of already adopted. And that's, I guess, I want to make sure that, that we're focused on what we, on at least what I thought, and maybe I'm, I'll be an outlier on this issue, but, but maybe what I thought we were going to focus on, which is taking our basic goals and the sub-goals and really the, all the work that we've already done and take that to the community and say, community, we are working on something that's more concrete for the next three to five years out of all these things, and here's what, you know, we need your input as to what those things should be. Do we truly want to have all kids speaking, uh, communicating effectively in at least two languages by the time they graduate from school? Or do we truly want to make sure that all of our kids are, you know, uh, technically literate? You know, I, I mean, those are what I would view more as strategic and focused and more narrowly uh, defined. I would call them objectives, and somebody else might call them goals. Well, I, I think the process is <clears throat> is designed to do a lot of what you just uh, described. And and remember, there's a whole part of this process that is implementation planning. So, you know, a, a whole lot of work is going to be spent on uh, once we have consensus of whatever these goals and objectives are, just for the sake of this conversation of what we're calling these, um, you know, then exactly what specifically is going to be done. So literally cluster by cluster, writing down exactly what's going to be done by when so that there's a clear roadmap uh, to monitor whether or not uh, you're actually moving in that, in that direction and whether or not you're implementing. And in, in a nutshell, whether you're doing what you said you were going to do. And, and so that's really, the, um, that's really the, the crux of it. But there is, there is no doubt that the focus groups and the engagement is going to um, allow people to dialogue over information that has been accumulated um, within the district so that some shared definition for what these are can emerge. Uh, and so that it's, uh, as, as the process moves forward, again, it's easier to align people and to, and to move the organization forward. And Dan, let me see if I'm understanding yeah, what thanks, you're asking. Thanks, sure. in, in terms of, you're asking that if you take that academic goal one, which defines the major core curricular areas, some expectations with them. You have some operational expectations that have been defined in terms of what you measure there. Yep. And take that yep. out to the community and say, are we on target with this goal? And what are the most important objectives to move this goal forward over the next couple of years is what you're looking for. Yes. So that you're defining the priorities within those goals that are already established for academic achievement for students. That's what I would, that would be my expectation, not to say, oh, what do you think we should have as, you know, academic goals? I'm so, we, we define that for the most part, not that somebody can't offer up new ideas, but I don't, if we do that, and, and the worry that I have is that we're talking about a limited period of time already, and we're talking about the difficulty of trying to define, put many more new elements into something that's already a major project. Right. So you don't want to leave it totally open-ended to say exactly. we're just going to start again. We're going exactly. to build upon the academic goals that we have for students, the life skill goals and the community goals. The one thing that I would say that might be the open-ended piece of it is all three of your key goals in strategic governance is our student outcomes, mm -hmm. which are essential, really important, critical kinds of things. I would commend you on doing those kinds, kinds of things and having them in your plan. There may be some other things around the operational side and the cultural side of your organization that may emerge as a goal in terms of your approach to accomplishing those, those things, not in terms of the academic, but um, a um, systems thinking kind of approach or a cultural shift kind of approach or um, there might be financial questions that become a goal. There might be um, facility questions that become part of that goal. That if you're going to accomplish those academic goals, are there other aspects of the organization that might be a priority for the next couple of years? And you do have some operational expectations around some of those areas that yeah, you monitor every very single carefully. one of those areas, and, right. and they're, they go five layers down right. as well. So, so it's a question of looking at those and what might be the most important priorities over the next few years as you collect that information from you as a board and from your community and from your staff moving forward. I think I've taken plenty of time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. McLaughlin, followed by Ms. Reed and Ms. Strauss. Okay. Uh, first of all, I just um, 
want to say that I really appreciate the ambitious timeline, uh, but I think this is such a critical step forward for this administration and for our school system. So it's my humble opinion that if you know you all need to get this right and you present it to the board when we come back from our August recess in September, I, I think that that is far more important that it, it's done well and done right than that we rush it based on the timeline. So I just wanted to first start off with my, my reservations. We're a massive school system. Uh, I don't know if you've ever worked with a school system of our size before, um, but I understand it's going to be a very important undertaking. And uh, I do have you know, that concern I just wanted to share with you and my colleagues and, and the superintendent, because I know we're all committed to this, but we want to be successful. Um, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, to build on a little bit what Dan was saying, I think it was really helping me shape where I hope we might be going, which is as a board member who only joined um, this team uh, two years ago, we did spend a significant amount of time um, reviewing the, the mission, beliefs, and values. Then we went to operational expectations. We made sure that the student achievement goals said the language we wanted. And so I really had hoped that maybe what we would be doing is looking at our operational expectations, because I think it goes to what Hank was saying, you know, what, what about the operations in the system? And the measurements that we currently have in place. And one of the things I've shared with the superintendent and my colleagues is that I don't feel that our measurements are necessarily the most mission critical in capturing what we want for our system. And so when you're doing your work, I would ask that you please um, bring your consulting expertise at looking at those measurements, because I actually think that might help us in being more strategic. Uh, but this board did spend significant amount of time with the operational expectations. You could look at those and say, you're a little redundant, here's how we could tighten these up, um, and, and that would help. Because I do think the staff was trying to be responsive to our operational expectations, so it's not a criticism of staff what those measurements look like. But I just don't, I think there's too many of them. It absorbs a massive amount of time of our staff to write these monitoring reports. It buries the board in, in just lengthy narrative, and I don't think we're um, as effective as a board or as a system with that. So I'd love to see at that part of the strategic um, plan and making us uh, more effective. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that it is um, illuminating and disconcerting at the same time to know that there were 22 initiatives um, going on. Uh, as a board member, I had no idea. And I can tell you, I don't recall passing 22 initiatives down onto the uh, system. So I think that it's, um, it's really good for us to be able to know that as a board. I'd be very curious to know about them, but I think it, uh, it might help us appreciate why down on the front lines, our principals um, are, are feeling the weight on their shoulders, our teachers in the classroom, and really everybody in the building. So um, I applaud this desire to be strategic and to be disciplined. That said, I, I get a little nervous because I'm someone who lives in a world of gray. I don't see things in extremes of black and white. And I, I hope that we will stay balanced, that being strategic does not mean we give up being responsive. Um, as a former athlete, I, I know how important it is to be a team player. You've got to have a st strategy to get on that field and be successful as a team. Have your game plan. But you never know what your opponent's going to do. And if you are in what I worry could be a straight jacket, and this is the game plan, this is how we're going to play it, and your opponent throws you a curveball you didn't expect, you're, you may not win the game. And I say that because when I think about all the wonderful things we have done in the system, both before I joined the board and even before, it was about being responsive. And so, um, you know, I hear my colleagues and the concerns that in being disciplined, we don't want to be ad hoc, we don't want to be reactionary. And I agree with Mr. Velkoff when he, he cited those concerns. Um, but I also know that one of the things that has been hard on our system is that when an issue does bubble up and it does require our attention, um, 
in the end, when I think about every single one of those issues, you can absolutely tie it to one of those three goals up there, like you mentioned, Hank. So I think I just, I hope that we'll all be very mindful that I, I don't want um, a strategic plan that feels like a straight jacket and then we don't end up being the responsive system that I was so excited when Dr. Garza said that was one of her, her primary goals of this first year, to improve upon a culture of responsiveness here in this county. I think it will build such great trust and enthusiasm in our community, and I don't want to lose that um, by this. So um, I, I just also want to say that I'm, I'm thrilled that the portrait of a graduate will be a guiding principle from doing this work. Um, one of the things that I've heard my board members really start to embrace, and our community as well, is educating the whole child. And we see that at the national level, that it isn't just test scores, but it really is um, helping our children leave this school system to be healthy, you know, effective, uh, accomplished men, men and women. And that does require um, educating that whole child. So um, I just wanted to kind of uh, emphasize those things um, and, and say that, uh, Again, if you need more time, you've at least got my vote. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Reed. Thank you, Ms. Stern at COFAX, and thank you all for being here and for all your help. This is very exciting. Some of us have been waiting a long time for this day. Uh, your questions that you pose, I'm going to focus on them. What do you hope to achieve? And I think we've alluded to it, but in, in my words, um, I'd like to articulate what I think it, it is, and then I'd like you to respond as to whether or not this is too tall an order. I'd like to achieve a multi-year approach that ties planning, evaluation, budgeting, and accountability together, communicates it clearly, aligns staff and programs, focuses efforts to achieve best results, and also acknowledges uh, constraints and the realistic forces at work. That's a lot there, but so I, I, I guess I just want to know is... No small task. Yeah, you, know, you know, we're kind of asking you for the moon here, but is that essentially what you will be able to give us, something that will help us tie those things together? Because I believe right now we're very fragmented in that regard. That is definitely the goal, you know, that you're trying to accomplish through this, but that depends on not only the work of ECRA Group, but the work of all of your... Um, your employees and your stakeholders, you know, throughout the system. And so, uh, but uh, without a doubt, that is the goal. But that starts with a framework that everybody can tie to. And so, you know, phase three of this process is if you have that strategic planning framework in place, then when you have the conversations with the leadership and the teachers and everybody that, that going to have to engage in this, um, that they sort of know what they're trying to tie to. Right. But this is, you know, strategic planning isn't here's the plan and, and, and then we do it, right? This is an evolutionary process. This is an organic process. And um, to make uh, comments both to, to your um, questions uh, and to um, uh, the previous question is that you, you have to look at strategic planning as a process, right? And you, so you have to look at it as uh, um, not this plan that's never going to change. If you know, Hank mentioned some of the other pieces, some of the or the operating pieces, the organizational pieces, right? Uh, and uh, responsiveness was uh, was mentioned. So, responsiveness in and of itself could be a strategic goal of the system to be more responsive, to create structures that are more responsive to change, right? I mean that this is the process has to flush some of that stuff out. But Hank's point was sometimes you need goal areas that don't relate to just academics. You need goal areas that relate to how the system functions, how the division operates uh, day in and day out. And so the goal is to tie and align all those pieces together, absolutely. But that's going to take time beyond just the process of getting the plan in place. It's building a culture and building operating practices in which everybody ties to it. Right. All the way down to uh, that's the way that uh, uh, goals flow, uh, flow through to uh, personnel evaluations, all the way down to the way you allocate resources, all the way down to the benchmarks you choose to judge and govern through, all of that. Uh, but that is, it's going to take some time. It's culture building, uh, but that, that is the, uh, the goal of what we're trying to create here. Well, that, that's good, and I'm hoping maybe that helped people a little bit with that discussion. Um, I'm glad that 
that uh, my expectations were accurate. And it does sound like, you know, that the journey begins with a single step. So we're, this is definitely, we're headed in the right direction with that. In terms of key issues to address, I, you've alluded to it. It's interesting. I'd written my notes and you all were saying changing the organizational culture and practices to identify and address key concepts. I think for us, it'll be a challenge to try to focus on those key concepts, you know, because we have so many things, but I mean, just things like the um, eliminating or reducing the achievement gap, um, things like this. We've talked about reading by grade three, allowing each child to reach their potential, preparing for the 21st century world. Um, those are things I think that, um, you know, we can have uh, robust discussions about, but I really, um, I feel we're going to need some help really trying to peel back the layers of the onion and, and try to focus because this group you can even see tonight, you know, I think it's going to be a challenge to, to get us to really focus. <laughs> Hank's laughing. And the last thing quickly, uh, quickly I will say here in terms of other questions uh, regarding community involvement, my question there really is that um, how, how far out can we go? I mean, you know, we have, as we did with our superintendent search, kind of there's this, the community groups that we typically um, talk to and hear from. But then there's, I mean, you could really kind of do your circles concentric out to all kinds of, you know, the, the former um, employees, former students, um, people who don't have kids in the system, businesses, the academic community, social service agencies. I mean, you know, at what point do you, I mean, these people all would have opinions, but I guess my question is, you know, for the purposes of this exercise, do you recommend uh, a certain group of individuals or do we, do we kind of cast the wide net and say, hey, anybody who's interested, come you know, give, a, give your feedback? I think, you, I think you can do both. I think you can cast cast a wide net, but I think you can also focus that because some of those groups that you mentioned are groups that we did invite to the leadership profile meetings. So we could certainly reach out to those specific groups again. And my last comment is, you know, we always talk, and I'm looking for Barbara Hunter, we always talk about how do we reach those groups that we have trouble reaching, you know, and so, you know, for this exercise too, it's again, how do you reach those people that we don't hear from? And, you know, we try to represent their voices and opinions and interests the best we can, but that would be, that continues to be a challenge for us is how do we make sure that we represent everybody who doesn't come to us? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Reed. I'll, I'll just make a comment. I, I know when um, I was talking to Gina, we spoke specifically about that as well, and that's where the, the Board of Supervisors came up, and we even talked. We didn't, I didn't go as broad as you did, Ms. Reed, but what I did talk about was how to get those, those people that are very involved in the schools and within the clusters, and you talked about how you're going to be working with individual clusters to get those people involved. People who may not be at the, you're talking about involved parents who may not be at the county council PTA but are really worker bees within that school, within that community, and their voices are very important. And you even took on a broader perspective, but I just wanted to share that, that thought with you. And I think Dr. Garza has a comment as well. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think some, some of the struggle that I observe um, is because it's, this is not really well-defined because it has to be somewhat organic. Would you agree with that? You know, it has to emerge from the needs, the desires, the aspirations of our own community. Um, and, and I do believe, um, you know, there's a lot of value in the work that's been done to date in the system. You know, there, there's um, a lot of ownership around this table. Um, and I think that over time there will be an opportunity for us to build. I think this will be a building process. Lots and lots of organizations go through strategic planning. They might have the best strategic plan in the world and they've executed it well, but there comes a time when you have to re-examine it, right? You have to kind of somewhat go through the process again. You have somewhat different stakeholders, um, and so you have to re-examine. I think, I think when we go through this process, some of what we currently have may actually continue, uh, but we also, it'll give us a chance to see where we headed the right direction. Um, I also think with very large systems, what we've struggled with um, is we need clarity and we need specificity. When I look, you know, and, and by the way, I don't know if, you know, I think it'd be, it's a worthwhile exercise to look at this with fresh eyes and go to our website and look at where all our goals are. Um, we need to be in a place where our, our stakeholder groups know what we're doing and where we're going. And I think to some extent we may have overcomplicated it 
um, not because we can't overcomplicate it and we can't do great things, it's, but it's harder for our community to understand it when it's that way. So um, I'm excited about this process, and it's not because this, this school system's great, but I think it's time you know, for us to again ask our community. I th what I've seen through the listening tours is we have smart people out there, and you know what they, they really have demonstrated a, a lot of appreciation for being a part of the process. Um, so I think we'll see um, that our community as a whole uh, will be very, very appreciative. I think they'll give us great insight, but I think we'll really be building upon the good work that's been done before. Um, and I, I think that um, it also demonstrates that we value their, what they have to say. But um, I, I think we, to some extent, we, we said this summer this was a goal. I think we have to trust that we've hired the right partner to help us do it. And I, 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 have, I have a lot of trust that we can get there with you all. And you'll have a lot to say as we go through this process. Um, with that said, do you have some school systems maybe that uh, some of our board members might could look at in terms of strategic plans that you all have helped develop? Maybe, and I, I, you know, it'll probably look very different here than it will in other places, but it might give some insight um, to what that could look like. Yeah, sure. We, we could, um, and, and Gina uh, might be able to speak to some, uh, some examples that actually um, uh, that would point to, you know, that given that nothing is exactly a match, right, but, but something that, uh, but we certainly could, and a lot of things are public, too. A lot, of, a lot of the final documents are public documents and things, too, so we can point you to other systems' websites where the plans are there and, and some of the dashboards that we've created for them that help them have the set of metrics and benchmarks that govern and all of that. And so we can, we can follow up with, with that information, absolutely. Because that'll give you examples of what I mean by a supporting evidence document, a strategic planning document, a dashboard, some metrics. Do you have, do you have anything else? Yeah, to add? I can, I'll make sure I send Dan. I can send them to you. Yeah. Okay. We have Miss Strauss followed by Miss Smith. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I was a little late. I had to make up the snow time for community meetings out there talking about the budget. So, it's out in Herndon. Um, I'm very excited at this process, and I'm very grateful that we have professional people to help us with this. This is the third or fourth time I've done this in my career. and Started with Dr. Spillane, um, keep the main thing the main thing. That was back in the 80s. Um, but it, the amount of work that has to be done, I think we will get it done with your help. Um, times when we have done this before ourselves, it takes a year or more of very heavy lifting. So um, I think I think your professional skill and what you bring to the table will be critical. And I think it's important that we get this done. Um, the uh, I don't want to see us drag this out. Our community is looking for uh, for the opportunity to be at the table again. And I, I agree with Dr. Garza. There is in any institution, no matter how good you are, there comes a time when you have to go back to your community and your stakeholders and have invite them to the table um, in really good faith to say, and what do you want? What are your beliefs? And I hope that we are able to um, talk with a lot of our very young parents, parents in their 20s and 30s, um, uh, Ryan's colleagues. I think that's a very important group because it is the parents of those children whose future is really beginning in our school system. And I really want to hear from them. They're very busy. They're very involved, working many jobs. They've got little kids. But I, I think that's very important. Often, um, when we go through a process like this, we can easily get to civic associations or uh, older adult leaders because they're available and they're used to coming to meetings. Um, but I really, would really like to get deep into that younger population, that younger cohort, because I think their voices are going to be a little different, and I think their voices will be very, very important. Um, the, uh, I was, along with uh, Ms. Darina Kofrex, um, we were part of the Portrait of a Graduate. That was really very exciting. And what I saw come forward as a part of that group, and those were a lot of very knowledgeable folks in the community, that there is, a, I think, a great deal of consensus on the sort of the broad uh, issue of sort of academic goals and uh, educating the whole child and 21st century skills all dressed and it was very nice to see that come forward whereas the last time um, 
uh, Fairfax County School Board went through this process, it was hard to get the community to agree with what we felt at the time, and this was like 10, 15 years ago, where we thought we needed to be. But I, I think we're finding that that that, that curve is, is, has disappeared now. But now the question is how to go forward. And I hope in, in where we get to with this, an understanding of focus and time for our educators particularly, I don't know if, since I was a little late coming to the table, um, the need to make sure that learning in the classroom is filled with joy and passion, and then we can get back to that, which means time, time for our children, time for our teachers. Um, the, um, I think one advantage that we have is it certainly is the national conversation that there's been too much emphasis on, st on high stakes standardized tests, and hopefully this will give us some space to create that time for real learning, real hands-on learning. Um, I also hope that you help us develop the communication tools. Um, I think Dr. Garza had indicated that we, we put out so much information, but it's complicated, and um, the community doesn't always, it, it's almost as though we have flattened communication so much that everybody is just looking for the tweet for the 140 characters, which we do too. But <laughs> it doesn't give them everything that they want. So um, I would be looking for advice on once we get all of this developed, how do we communicate it, how do we, and how do we keep it fresh? Because it is organic. This process must be organic. Um, I think Megan had mentioned it must be responsive. We certainly, our community, particularly our younger parents, expect us to be able to meet a myriad of needs for each individual child. And, um, and that, is an important driver in how we get there. So I'm excited, I'm looking forward to this, and um, I think we can get it done, and I think we'll have an excellent work product. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Strauss. I have Ms. Smith followed by Mr. Ash. That darn roll of seven, if seven people talk, we all better, huh? Um, I'm looking forward to the work. I, I told Gina when we talked, I don't have in my mind what the end should look like. I think it's gonna be an exciting process to learn about. But I love the word focus. I mean, you hear 12 of us, you're gonna hear different things. So one of the things that I'm hoping that the strategic plan will provide is that focus that then the board will use that as a lens for decision making as we go to other work we do. Um, I think it is powerful when you go out into the community and even if people don't specifically know what to do in schools, they know what they want for their kids. They know the skill sets they want their kids to have. So it will be good to refresh that and hear it. You know, so much of what Dan said resonated with me because there's only a few of us left that were on the board that first developed those goals, but it was a process like giving birth but it was also the changes we've seen. And, and Dan Paris was around. We talked about this when we first did it. And so some of us on the board heard the changes in how our staff spoke. And you heard it in schools, and you heard principals, and you hear teachers talking about essential life skills. And you see all these schools that are doing projects to benefit the community. So this can be a very powerful process that can change the system. And I think hopefully bring the board together to achieve what we want for our kids. So I'm excited about it. I look forward to it. Thank you. Mr. Ash, followed by Mr. McAlvin. <laughs> I know, I know, Megan. I got it. <laughs> so I hug him every time I say it wrong. So uh, I'm... I'm in a I'm a, a little bit of an interesting situation that I won't be here um, when this plan goes into action. Um, I won't get to see. Uh, I don't I don't know if I'm going to get to see any of the products um, uh, from any of the phases. But um, let's see. But I I plan to uh, inform my um, my successor about everything that's going on here and what it means. Um, and. Uh, ha have prep him for working with the strategic plan. Um, I, I think the thing I like about the strategic plan is that it uh, puts in our minds the end game. It's not just what we want to focus on right now, which I feel like the um, student achievement goals do very well. They're always what we, they're 
almost a timeless um, what we want out of our students. Um, and as they get more specific, they get more into what we want to see uh, in looking ahead to the future. But I think the end game really looks, um, or the strategic plan really puts in mind the end game of, well, okay, in five years, um, what are going to be the needs then? Um, what, what are going to be the new 21st century skills that pop up? Um, and so how can, we, how can we start to work those into our uh, system, predict them? Um, and, and another thing, it's not just targeted at what we want out of our students. It's, uh, I think it's one, one of the benefits will really be looking at, um, at every level of the system, how we can uh, g give each level something to really at attach, uh, attach onto um, and work with then th that they can then go and say, okay, I'm, I can do this. Um, per and I think one of the things I'd really like to see um, would be not only uh, expectations for the system, but expectations for different, uh, the, the different levels um, and really working with them so that each, each person knows what they has some way to measure themselves and know when they're achieving success. Um, so uh, a couple of questions. Could, could you give us a brief, like, um, you talk, you've talked about a bit the implementation plan, and, um, but what, what, could that, what could that cover? Like, what, what would be in, in an implementation plan, I guess? So the, the implementation plan is, um, from, a, from a process perspective, it's, it's a facilitation with the leaders uh, that are out uh, working in the schools and working in the clusters, right? And so uh, the important thing to understand about the implementation plan is that it ties right to the strategic plan. And so what the implementation plan essentially will be doing is working objective by objective, saying what do we need to put in place by when to achieve that? And that's really the work of the objective. And that's going to be uh, uh, principals and other school level leaders and cluster level leaders dialoguing, working together, uh, understanding the student bodies that they do serve, understanding their schools and their systems, and making smart choices about how do we implement that within, uh, within our cluster, but doing it at a level of specificity so there is no ambiguity as to what is supposed to be done. Uh, you know, sort of the, the, the test at that point, at that tactical stage is if it isn't just immediately when you read it recognizable as to whether you're going to be able to judge whether it was done or not just at, at surface value, then it's probably not specific enough. And so we're really going to be working with the, the leadership to say uh, you got to get down to something specific so that it's very easy to know whether you did it or you didn't. Uh, because I, I'll go back to my comments uh, earlier is that um, there's no, you're going to come up with brilliant ideas and strategies for, and objectives for things that might work. And, and this process is going to provide focus. Right? Uh, and then we're going to align some specific steps that need to be done. But that's where things, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Because, uh, you know, right, basic, you're, um, you can have the best strategy in the world, but if it's not implemented well, it's not going to have a difference. And so that's, that's really what the implementation uh, plan is all about. In addition to the um, to the metrics piece too. The implementation plan will also uh, begin to have some conversations around how do you measure this stuff? What are the appropriate benchmarks? And that's where we can really lend a lot of expertise. You know, we have a whole measurement and assessment um, division. We have a, a ton of expertise around data and analytics and metrics and benchmarks. Um, and uh, not only expertise in, in the science of those things, but in the experiences that we have as a firm in helping the districts think through those. And so that's all going to be part of this process. Okay. Um, and so um, you you also described how you were going to um, review mission statements. So will that be just uh, and and documents like that? That's another component. Is if I understand it, another component to the piece, like uh, stakeholder input, um, or is is that? Are, are you you're you're not? Sorry, you aren't really looking to revise that. You're using that as a base, right? Right, and so this is where the, the process looks very different from system to system. I mean, some, um, uh, some engagements that when we start, the, the mission and vision statements are, um, people like them, they, they believe that uh, um, it reflects them, and we go out to the community and we do community engagement, and that just validates it and reaffirms it, and then our recommendation is don't touch it, right? But other times, 
you know, uh, we, we enter an engagement. We say, we haven't looked at that mission or vision statement in 15 years. I don't think it reflects us at all. And we go out to the community and we say, you're right, it doesn't. And so we recommend revising it. And so um, that, that's part of the process, right? It's part of the process making sure that uh, that's what, what is in place um, is reflective of the community, uh, but this process can validate a lot of that stuff as well. So I can't be, what I don't want to do is imply that anything in this process is aimed at r revising or undoing anything. It's meant at advancing everything, right? But advancing it in a way that's more organized and advancing it in a way that's more focused and advancing it in a way that's going to be easy to layer accountability over it to know whether or not you're doing what you've set out to do. And that's really the, the focus of all this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McElveen. So one of the things, those, those of us who are on the, the um, Selection Advisory Committee for this group know that some of you don't is, is some of the backgrounds of, um, of both John and Gina. And I thought uh, the board should hear about uh, a little bit about what they do um, other than their work on um, Sir, on um, work like this. So if you could just give sure. us a brief background. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So uh, <clears throat> my background is in uh, research methodology and statistics. My PhD um, is in statistics and uh, quantitative methodology. Um, in addition to serving as ECRA Group's uh, president, I'm also the director of research uh, and professor at Northwestern University, uh, where I head up all their uh, programs in predictive analytics and statistics. And so uh, my expertise is very deep in, uh, in psychometrics, in statistics, in uh, not only methodology as it relates to knowledge acquisition, but methodology as it relates to um, organizational transformations and, me and, and methodology for how you organize systems and how you organize information to help advance systems. Um, one of the things that I've taken as an interest throughout my career is, um, you know, how do you use information as catalysts for change? How do you inject the right information into organizations so that you elevate the knowledge base of the organization so the organization moves in the direction that you want it to move? Uh, because uh, although it's cliche, knowledge is power, it's cliche for a reason, is because if, if, you, if you educate the system to a point that the direction is understood and the direction is valued, you don't have to push anybody. People are gonna go there on their own. And so part of this process is to arrive at not only goals and objectives that just resonate as making sense, but then to layer the information ar architecture and, and, and layer the information such that people see this is the only direction to go. And if you keep uh, that feedback cycle and you keep that information and those communication channels going, you will see tremendous results. And so, um, again, a bit of background of, uh, on myself. Um, and uh, Gina can give a little background on herself. And I, I did share individually with each of you, but my background is I'm an industrial psychologist. And a lot of what John um, talked about is similar to my background in that I study large systems and organizational change. Um, a specialty area in my research background is in organizational climate. So we talked about, like Hank had raised some other issues that might come to play, such as organizational culture issues. They link to student achievement. You know, how well your employees enjoy coming to work every day has a huge impact on student achievement. Um, so my background in that sense, and, and I come from a corporate background as well, and I have a lot of experience working with union groups and um, facilitation on just group dynamics. And, and one thing that I guess I would just mention in my background too that lends itself to some of this conversation too is um, uh, a research area of mine too is the whole idea of how do you monitor individual student growth. I mean, how do you connect uh, desperate indicators of progress on kids under cohesive models that you can truly use to judge more holistic growth and holistic progress. And so um, that's an area that I spend a lot of time thinking about. All I do is think about it. Um, and so I can lend that, that perspective and that expertise uh, throughout this process too when the time is right to talk about how do we measure uh, what it is that we're setting out to do. Thank you. Um, I have used uh, the chair's prerogative tonight to uh, make my comments as I go along, but I did want to share one more comment, and I had a, um, a housekeeping question as well. Um, 
my background was marketing and communications, and I actually looked up my definition that I was using. I worked in trade and for trade and professional associations, and we talked about strategic planning as a process that provides focus and pathways to reach our goals. It was simp simple, um, but I think we used a lot of the same words here tonight. So I'm, I'm um, happy to, you know, even though the buzzwords are different from industry to industry, I think um, I'm very pleased at the way um, th that you were chosen and um, the way you are presenting this to us. I think um, when, when we look at it in, in a simple way, I think we're all going to be very, very happy with the end result. Um, I had a housekeeping question when, we, when it came to the timelines. I understand that we're not going to be getting any information until early June. But how will you keep either the staff or the staff and the board apprised of the focus groups when they're occurring, how, when you're reaching out to these groups? Because I personally would like that information. And, and, and in fact, I think you all have been working on a very specific timeline with, with staff that we can propose to you all. So that, that is a general timeline, but I understand the need to have much more specificity around the steps, the milestones throughout this process, and I, I believe that's on target to eventually be accomplished. Okay. So you would have all those dates and know kind of what's happening along the way. All right. Thank you so much. And I have one go back from Ms. Hines. Okay. Mr. Belkoff, you didn't want to? You sure? Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, after listening to everybody, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, one, um, Kathy, you talked about how this was like giving birth coming up with this. And it's funny because as a relatively new member and like straight out of the classroom, I, I have to say that even though I like these three statements, our conversations where we spent hours wordsmithing deeper and deeper into the weeds of what this means were very painful for me because I could not see the connection with the classroom, honestly. But then when I looked at the portrait of the graduate, I looked at that, I was like, this is actionable in the classroom right away the first time I saw it. You know, I could take this and the program of studies and a team of, uh, of, of other teachers and I could, I could build a fourth grade year with this. Um, so that's, I guess, and I think one of the reasons that we find ourselves making strategic errors, like 22 initiatives in one year, reams of data that we don't really need and can't really use, and at the same time, gaps in instructional strategy like early literacy, you know, I think that has been a gap for us, is because we really have not aligned this with the classroom. And I think the portrait of a graduate will help us do that. So my point, I guess, is that I would like ultimately, I would like to see our focus be on life in the buildings, you know, classroom instruction, what that looks like, you know, are we, are we providing a place where, where the work is relevant and powerful and joyful for everyone? Um, and I, I think also <laughs> we're, we're going to run into the question of constraints, and I guess I would like us as Fairfax County to feel like we can be bold and say it's okay for us in our strategic plan to lead the state and lead the nation because there will be things going on in Richmond and in Washington that will want to tell us to do things in a different way. But, you know, so that's just my thought. Mr. Stork. Earlier in some of the remarks you made talked about um, the recognition that uh, different either areas or schools might have different pers perspectives, agendas, whatever you might, and that the a core part of, a, of any plan is kind of recognizing or, or incorporating ways of meeting the needs of various groups and, and different levels of needs within that. Um, so I guess I want to just reassure myself that your plan to, um, to engage the, the public on these issues is going to include a wide enough mix of, of schools and populations, particularly because, um, as I'm sure you're familiar with this and in, in work that you've done in any other community, um, the neediest parents, the parents of the neediest children, which typically are those who are, are economically disadvantaged or immigrants, et cetera, are the ones that are most difficult to, to hear their voices or get their voices. And then the other part of that is how do you, and maybe this is premature to ask this question. If, if so, then, then I'll withdraw it. And, and just if you could prepare to answer it whenever that moment comes, how do you, um, how do you, take those lessons, those, that information, that data, if you will, and incorporate that into a plan that's uh, flexible enough yet not, doesn't have 22 initiatives in it. You know, there's that, that balance. 
that uh, I think we recognize is essential to the to a process. Yeah, but the, thing, the first piece on the engagement, we're going to work closely. We were actually meeting about this today and we'll continue to do so to ensure that there is an opportunity for all the schools for, for us to hear a voice from each school. That would be the ideal scenarios if we can at least get participation from every school within the clusters. So that's a goal that we're working on um, to strategize around to make sure that there is an opportunity for that. And for those people that aren't um, often brought in to participate, that they are reached out to. So what, whatever that is, whether that's pairing somebody, giving up somebody assignment to go out and find that one individual or work through, you know, one of the parent groups to identify someone that maybe hasn't been in. Um, but, you know, we, we want to definitely hear from some of the groups that have been identified before and that are frequently in, in cause we want to make sure they feel included, but we want to make sure that there's an extra effort to reach out beyond the voices that you already hear. How have you incorporated that, the differing needs? I mean, we're obviously, you worked with, Larger, larger system, I don't know if one are large, our size or not. How have you incorporated those disparate needs, if you will, within a, strategic, a common strategic plan for an institution? So, so the way that we try to do that is, you know, getting back to, to the, the framework of goals and objectives versus tactics again, is um, the goals and the objective pieces, if, if, we, if we have the right conversations, if we collect the right information, right? Um, if we uh, have the right dialogue over sort of what are the fundamental beliefs about how, you know, just how to improve education in today's world, right? We should be able to write goals and objectives that are sort of universal to education that just deal with the beliefs of education here at Fairfax County Public Schools, right? Um, then from there, there's no doubt that the the way in which it gets implemented school by school or really cluster by cluster um, will vary a little bit. And so maybe professional learning communities looks different in one school than it does in another, right? Or maybe uh, reading support programs look different in one school than it does in another, right? Um, but you can still have an objective that there's a fundamental belief in, in collaborative learning, let's say, as an example. Or there's a fundamental uh, belief in uh, high standards and expectations. Now, these are things that I think everybody could stipulate to that this is important, whether you're talking about the, the, uh, the student that struggles the most or the brightest student in the district, right? I think um, high expectations and standards is one of those universal things that have shown repeatedly uh, in educational research to matter, right? There are certain things that So you're really talking matter. more tactics than you are goal differentials. Yeah, we look at this as there's tactical autonomy but there is not strategic autonomy. And by strategic, we mean the goals and objectives are at the enterprise level. But the tactics then are autonomous to the clusters uh, in a way. You, you have to let the innovation you know, be out in the field. They're the ones closest to the students. They're the ones closest to the challenges. So to, um, to take it too far to say that this is exactly how you have to improve the system, I think isn't recognizing how much institutional knowledge resides in your buildings. And so part of that process is uh, at the enterprise level, what do we believe as fundamental truths about how you improve education reflected in goals and objectives, and then how do you let that implementation play out, uh, you know, across the system? And, and if I can add, you know, it's important to remember this is a partnership, right, and that we're doing this. I'm excited to work with them and learn from them, and I think they're excited to work with us and learn from us, right? And you know, we have a lot of expertise that, that I don't think, that for me personally, I haven't been exposed to in the past. And we bring some expertise to the table too, right? So some of the things you're talking about, I think some of the expertise of the school people we have is how do you drop this down to five feet and make it happen, right? So there's board members around this table that have had children in my school, and when we look to do these things, we said, look, there's a lot of rich, wonderful things that are going on in the school. I don't want to stop it, right? But there are also some core foundational things that we need to do really well in our school. Every single teacher has to know how to do this piece really well. And initially going into it, the fears that you have, I was there. I was like, man, if we systems think and enterprise around this, it's somehow going to redact it just to that. And I was dead wrong. Right? That when you do those things well, people aren't going to stop doing all the rich things that are around it. They're going to proliferate. And in fact, you've attended to those foundational needs and understandings. It helps you go way past where you've been in the past. So I have zero worry that in this, I don't think you could redact Fairfax to a, a limited set of 
things if you wanted to, but I think focusing on the right items that move schools forward, giving them some tactical autonomy to make it themselves, having clarity across the district that these are things over the next three to five years we need to focus on and prioritize, not that we necessarily, and then allow people, if they want to put other stuff on it, as long as they're doing those things well, that is where this, I think, this system needs to be, and I think this is going to be an exciting partnership to make it happen. And, and you know, I think you can't stop anxiety, right? People are always going to have anxiety around doing something different. That we wouldn't be humans if that wasn't the case. All right, I have one last go back, and that's for Miss Reed. And I promise it's quick. And that is uh, looking at your process that you've articulated. Uh, this right here. Um, I wondered to what extent you're going to synthesize and collect and put out what you're hearing versus provide um, independent analysis and suggestions similar to what Hank did earlier tonight. You know, I guess, you know, to keep the process authentic, are you only going to report back what you've heard, you know, regarding a suggestion such as that, gee, maybe you all should think about, you know, having a goal be this or, you know, measuring it this way. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that? So, so we're going to collect a lot of information throughout this process, right? That information is going to come from stakeholders, from focus groups, from surveys, from achievement analysis, from, from vast documentation that you've had, um, other initiatives that, that have been running uh, throughout the district. So we do um, uh, believe that part of our responsibility, part of the, the reason why you engage consultants, right, um, is to let at least our perspective surface. Right, because I think that's part of what you get out of, of a relationship um, with a firm like us. And so um, what we do is we take all of that information and we synthesize it. Right? So, so it, it's going to go through a much more um, uh, refined synthesis than just summarizing and giving you back the information to consider and dialogue around. We're going to synthesize all of the pieces of information, again, into statement of findings that we believe, for the sake of planning, these findings are real. Now, you can dialogue over them and you can have conversation, right? But um, what are these key pieces that really should be essentially at some point stipulated to or assumed as fact for the sake of planning anyway so that you can move the, so you can move the process along? But where our, our thinking or our recommendations comes, come through, if you will, um, and I, I don't want to I don't want to make it seem as recommendations because we're not here to, to basically, you know, recommend, you know, do this or do that. Um, but we are here to give our perspective. And so we give our perspective through that draft plan uh, that we submit and through the uh, synthesis of the information that we've collected. And so that's really where uh, our experience and our expertise around research and analytics and uh, planning methodology, that's really where it um, work gets exposed. Thank you. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> well, thank you all. We look forward to working with you very much in the coming months. And with that, this work session is adjourned.